Hey there, fellow wanderers. I hope you're all doing well. If you're new to my channel, welcome. And if you've been here before, I'm sending you a big virtual hug to welcome you back. I'm Becky, the slow traveling wanderer. If you watched my last video on why I've chosen Mexico City as my next home and why I think it's a global city that offers an exceptional quality of life that few other cities can compete with, then you know this is part due. While I will be covering the second half of positives, I will end the video with the downsides. Every city has them. No city is perfect and neither is Mexico City. And you'll find out what those are if you choose to live here so that you go into it eyes wide open. Now these downsides aren't necessarily an issue if you're just visiting the city. I think everyone should visit Mexico City and spend time in the city. But the downsides really apply to um, people who choose to live here long term. All right. Okay, let's dive into part two. Getting into the factors in no particular order that makes CDMX an amazing city to live in or to visit, let's talk food. Of course, food. You're probably wondering in part one, why didn't she mention the food? Well, here it is. I'm not made of stone people, come on. For those who don't know, Mexican food has obtained UNESCO World Heritage status as an intangible contribution to humanity. There's only one other cuisine in the world to have this designation, and that's Japanese food. The variety of ingredients, the cooking technique, the complexity, the use of many ingredients domesticated in the country continually over thousands of years. This is a designation that both Mexico and Japan have received, and it is unique. Now, let's talk about local markets. Have you ever seen so many bright and natural colors? This is truly eating the rainbow. The variety of fruits and vegetables, chilies, seeds, and herbs found in Mexico is mind-blowing. This is the healthiest combination of plant-based food you can eat on the planet. That is, if you make an effort to incorporate as many as you can into your daily diet. When we talk about prepared foods, we have street food, restaurants with the best salsas, seafood, and places that have sold one item, a turkey torta, a Mexican sandwich, at Loncheria Las Ramblas for over 90 years in the same location. Did you know that turkey is indigenous to Mexico? It was domesticated in Mexico by the Maya somewhere between 300 BC and 100 AD. You'll have some of the best breakfasts anywhere. And yes, you also have a lot of meat options if you're a carnivore. However, for my vegetarian and vegan friends, don't despair. I have lived in Mexico City as a vegan. I was a practicing vegan in 2018. I now am more of a flexitarian, if you will. I can tell you firsthand that there are an infinite number of vegan and vegetarian options. In fact, more so than many US and European cities. So check it out. You might think, oh my God, I'm gonna gain 50 pounds if I live there. Well, paradoxically, Americans especially lose weight. I know, I've heard it from a few people, even when eating as you normally do, or maybe what seems like a little bit more, you still lose weight. And why? That's because food in Mexico is so natural and portions are smaller. Everything served in restaurants is prepared from scratch with real ingredients, no boxes, no processed food, no chicken that looks like a wood block. Ugh, gross. The portions are also made for humans and not beasts of burden, <laughs> as we do in the US. <laughs> Terrible. Tacos are small. I find that when I go to Mexico without even adjusting my eating habits, I lose five pounds in two weeks typically, without even trying. Not to mention all the walking that you do in Mexico City versus most other US cities also contributes to this. So have I sold you yet? Wink, wink. Oh, and let's not forget the bread and pastries. This one deserves its own mention. Another fun fact. Did you know that the French brought bread making techniques to Mexico? Till this day, the best croissants I've ever had outside of Paris have been in Mexico City. 
I've known several Mexican people who have pursued a career in what's called reposteria, which is the art of pastries and dessert, and many of them have studied in France. Bread and pastries have been such a part of Mexican history that there was even a war declared in Mexico related to it. I'm not kidding. Let's learn a little history here. In 1838, a war occurred that started in Mexico City called Guerra de los Pasteles, and in English, the Pastry War. It was a brief war that lasted three months, but it did result in 64 people being killed or wounded on the French side and 224 on the Mexican side. So people died. This led to the first French intervention in Mexico, and there would be a second hint Cinco de Mayo celebrates the second victory where Mexico beat the French army. Apparently a French pastry chef known as Monsieur Remontel claimed that Mexican officers stopped at his shop, ate pastries and didn't pay. And that they later returned and looted his shop in Tacubaya, Mexico City in 1828. By the way, Tacubaya is still a neighborhood or a colonia in Mexico City. The chef then demanded compensation of 60,000 pesos, which was an enormous sum when the typical daily wage in Mexico City was one peso. Remontel's shop was valued at less than a thousand pesos. So, ugh, greedy, greedy French. Mexico refused to pay, as I would have as well. The King of France then ordered French ships to block all ports from the Yucatan to the Rio Grande. Mexico then declared war. Interestingly enough, the U.S. backed France and Mexico was backed by the United Kingdom. What? I know. Craziness, right? History is fascinating. Anyway, the battle ensued. Mexico agreed to pay the sum, which was ridiculous in my opinion, but whatever. A peace treaty was signed and the French got trade commitments from Mexico, which is really what they were looking for. I think they were just looking for an excuse. However, Mexico never paid the 600K, and that led to the second intervention in 1861. And hence Cinco de Mayo was born, the French were kicked out, never to be seen again, all because of some pastries. <laughs> all right, moving on. The wine. This one will be short. Suffice to say that Mexico has been on the late train on this one, preferring beer, tequila, mezcal, and pulque. Granted, Mexico produces so many of their own different types of alcohol and spirits that wine was very low on the list. However, I think that with the growth of hipster culture, quote unquote, and I would say with Netflix series also showing how wine is a big part of brunch culture and evenings with friends, etc., around the world, has led to Mexico embracing wine as well and is slowly growing its offering. I will say this though, the wine that you typically find in Mexico is limited and it's quite expensive. It's the only downside. Next, let's talk entertainment. From traditional to kitschy to modern, whatever you like, you can listen to mariachi and drink some good tequila at the Nampa, which was founded a hundred years ago. <laughs> Or how about karaoke? Or how about Lucha Libre, Mexican wrestling? So much fun. I thought it was quite tacky in all honesty and I was like, oh my God, yeah, no, that's not, that's not something for me. But I finally went with a group of friends back when I lived in 2018 when I lived there and I loved the crowd and the energy. It really is intoxicating. Again, this will take a while to return. Suffice to say, in a city as big, artistic, and entrepreneurial as Mexico, the options for entertainment are endless. Peggy, where are you at? Now let's talk about the gorgeous indoor spaces. As you've probably seen by now, Mexico City is made up of a tremendously artistic people who love beautiful spaces and push the envelope on what indoor space can and should look like. 
What I particularly love is a constant balancing with nature. This is one example that you see here of many places with trees growing out of them. I know, yes, you heard right, trees growing out of indoor spaces. In this example, you see a restaurant that opened and there was a tree in a not so convenient spot. In the US, they would have cut the tree down without question. In Mexico City, these guys built a bar around it and also built a roof around it. How many places in the world have you seen like this? I haven't seen many. I love this. Here you see other spaces which are just inviting. Beautiful spaces in harmony with natural surroundings make for happy people. Next is how quirky and surreal it is. You will see things in Mexico City and in Mexico in general that you simply will not see anywhere else in the world. Stuff that's completely random at times. Like here, a person decided to plop an 18th century style chair with matching side table painted in a bright yellow and even placed a porcelain bulldog ornament on top of the table. This was literally in a walkway Calle Amsterdam just randomly placed. Why? I don't know. We'll never know. An artistic inspiration, perhaps? Next, let's talk about how dog-friendly Mexico City is. For those of you that don't know, Mexico City dogs are by far the most polite and well-mannered dogs I've ever encountered anywhere. If you ever walk the city, you're bound to run into numerous dogs and with their owners. They're very well behaved. You can tell they're happy. They're always smiling as dogs tend to do. They say that dogs are a reflection of their owners and therefore one could argue they are a reflection of the society that they live in. That makes sense to me. In the US, too many dogs are aggressive, unruly, and a little psychotic, to be honest. <laughs> and yeah, that basically describes a general US population. <laughs> uh, I joke, I joke. But there is a little bit of truth in that. And despite having so many dogs in the city, you rarely run into dog poo on the sidewalks. And they also take them to work. I saw this one park cleaner with her little dog following her around as she swept the park. And oh, let's not forget the occasional pet pig. So cute. Happy dogs and other pets. Gotta be inclusive. All right, next, the street art. And I do mean street art, not graffiti. I never tire of seeing the many murals in the city, the colors, the messages, uh, the element of artistic energy and beauty that they contribute to the city. Can we talk about how beautiful and warm the Mexican people are? Yes, that's my next factor, the Mexican people. Mexican people are known worldwide really at this point for being some of the gentlest, kindest, warmest, and most accepting and welcoming people on the planet. You can go to any YouTuber who's filmed a video in Mexico somewhere and hear it from foreigners again and again. The only thing that English speaking foreigners who don't speak Spanish sometimes miss is how polite and well mannered Mexican people are and are actually known throughout Latin America and Spain for being very polite and well mannered. People will go out of their way to help you, especially if you're a foreigner, or if you're not from around there. People go to the ends of the earth to develop a strong sense of community and to maintain positive relationships. Now, there is a little bit of a downside to this Mexicans don't like to say no which some foreigners living in Mexico City have complained about because it leads to confusion and sometimes flakiness. But hey, I think in the end, they're just trying not to hurt your feelings. All right, we're almost at the end here. Next is how clean the city is. You see people wiping down, sweeping, cleaning, mopping constantly. And when you consider that Mexico City has more than 8 million people living in the city proper, it has a metro population of 10, 22 million, and you walk the streets and take note of how much trash you find, you won't find much. You find a plastic bottle thrown here or there, but generally it is very clean. 
especially the bathrooms. And I know this sounds weird, but I went around at one point seeing if I could find one bathroom that was in bad state, just out of curiosity, but I really didn't. Almost every single bathroom was spotless. And I mean spotless, not, not, not just clean and you know orderly, spotless. It was hard to believe, but true. Okay, the next factor is tolerance and inclusivity. When I lived in Mexico City in 2018, I found it perplexing, but impressive, how inclusive the city is. It's such a Catholic city and country. I mean, there's a basilica in Mexico City where something like 6 million people visit the Virgin of Guadalupe every December. Not to mention, it still has a very macho type of culture. But even then, it is quite open and tolerant. Here are some pictures during Pride, June 2019. The city buses were even painted with the rainbow. And this bus in particular says, proud to be making progress. I was and remain impressed. All right, so that does it for the positive factors, which combined add up to a one of a kind global city like no other, one that I've chosen to make my next home. Now let's talk about the downsides because every city has them and Mexico City is no exception. And I'll remind you that for the most part, these really only apply if you're looking to live in the city long-term. If you're just talking about visiting a few days, these aren't really gonna affect you other than the traffic and the aggressive drivers. So let's dive into it. Number one, traffic and the aggressive drivers. While most foreigners are not going to own a car in Mexico City, you will have to walk the streets of Mexico City. Just know that the cars have the right of way and not you. You have to be a defensive walker and a defensive bicycle rider. The positive is that there are many bicycle lanes throughout the city, so they at least protect you if you're riding a bicycle. But the negative is that there are so many cars on the streets and many won't stop. So you have to be very careful when crossing at a large intersection, even if the light is green and the walk sign is on. Literally cars will just drive right by you. It is a downside because there's lack of respect there for the person who's walking. But you know, I guess you gotta be like in New York City when you're walking in Mexico City, right? Like, hey, I'm walking here. <laughs> anyway, number two, the smog. In Spanish, they refer to it as contaminación, contamination, basically. Clarify why smog occurs. It has nothing to do with people or the city being dirty. It has to do with the topography and weather. Mexico City, like LA, implemented loads of policies to address uh, the smog, which was terrible in the 80s and 90s. Mexico City has an immense public transit system that people actually use. How about that? Having said all this, let's talk topography and weather. Mexico is built in a valley, which is flanked by volcanoes and some other mountains. And this creates a space where carbon emissions and greenhouse gases are held and not allowed to dissipate. The one positive point that Mexico City has over LA as an example is that it has a very long rainy season. The rains really help clear out the pollution. Also, the pandemic has been helpful too, fewer cars on the road. All in all, you can expect no more than, I would say five to seven days in any given year of bad air. And by bad air is, I, I mean, it's bad enough where people won't go out and you probably wouldn't and shouldn't exercise outside. However, based on my friends who currently live in Mexico City, it typically doesn't exceed that. All right, number three, the noise. Mexico City is not for people who are sensitive to noise. It is one of the noisiest cities I've ever been to and lived in. You have the recyclers uh, you hear in this clip drive by five times a day, three if you're lucky. You have people playing their own music, sometimes loudly, including the construction workers. You have the tamales Oaxaqueños person. You have the carrito de camotes. That means a person who's selling candied yams. This is the only sound that really annoys me. My ears just can't handle the high pitch. But I will tell you, like anything, you get used to it. 
And to me, it now signifies life. I cannot stand a super quiet neighborhood where it seems like no one is living and sounds completely dead. That's not my idea of life. Having said that, I'm not gonna lie. It does take some getting used to because Mexico City is definitely on the high end of that noise scale. Next to last, we have dating. And what do I mean by that? So many people don't realize how young Mexico is as a country and Mexico City in particular is as a city. The average age in Mexico as a whole is 29 years old. In Mexico City, it's even a year younger, it's 28. While in the US, the average age is 37, so almost 10 years older. And in Europe, it's 47, so very old for sure. I remember when I was in Germany in Hamburg, I was really shocked by the average uh, person on the street. They were all, you know, gray haired and older and, and you just saw it everywhere and you could see how fast the society there is aging. And that goes for all of Europe. So one of the challenges that creates in Mexico is dating if you're over 35, like I am. I'm in my 40s, I'm still single. I still hold out hope that I may meet someone to be my partner in crime. So I'm still actively in the dating scene, not right now with pandemic, but I hope to be. Well, going to Mexico City, that's gonna be really rough. Generally, if you're over 35, you're probably going to mingle or meet other expats because it's very difficult everyone's so young in mexico city to really be part of that dating scene and that goes for both men and women because if you're a guy you might have a little bit of leeway there but the honest truth is if you're over 35 you're going to be competing with a bunch of 25 28 30 year olds and that's just a fact sorry to break your heart guys but that is the truth lastly and this is the toughest negative for us foreigners the one that almost pushed me away from Mexico City despite all of its other numerous positives. And that's the rental rules and finding an apartment. If you plan to live there long term, this is by far the biggest obstacle you will have to overcome. I struggled a lot with this in 2018, but since I knew I was only there short term, I was willing to pay a higher rental rate through Airbnb. However, Airbnb is not sustainable over the long term. Now knowing what people pay in the city, people who live there permanently, with Airbnb, you pay a 50% to 100% premium. That's right, almost double the price on Airbnb versus what you would pay if you were to directly rent an apartment in the city. Okay, amigos, I'm going to end this video here. I decided I'm gonna put out a separate video specifically focused on the Mexico City rental situation, including neighborhoods you should consider, websites to use, how to look for apartments, and really get deeper into it. It's just such a big challenge for expats who want to move to the city that I wanna give this topic its own video to help you understand how rentals work in Mexico City and how to navigate the situation, which is quite complicated. Before I sign off though, I wanted to mention one last downside. I was on the fence on this one because I, I think it's temporary due to the pandemic and I'm sure many cities are going to struggle with this. Just look at this recent video here on what's happening in Austin, Texas currently. Times are tough. Anyway, one additional downside is an increase in panhandling. I, I really just noticed it this last time that I was there two weeks ago, and my friend who lives there also mentioned that there is a big increase in panhandling. People in Mexico City have been out of work for so long now and families are struggling, especially people from the areas in the periphery, um, such as the state of Mexico or Estado de Mexico. So people are just hustling, trying to make a peso where they can. You know, you don't have to give everyone money, but be kind and generous when you can. And know that people will come up to you while you're eating especially and try to sell you stuff and ask for money. And it does get tiring after a while. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. It's just something to be aware of. Bueno, mis amigos. I hope you found this information and video helpful. And if you did, please give it a like and consider subscribing. I'll leave it here. Hasta la próxima. See you next time. Bye.